Hello, and welcome to the keynote conversation of the October 2021 meeting of Race Before Race. Our theme is region and enmity. I'd first like to thank our sponsors who've made this conversation possible. We would like to acknowledge the generous support of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, the Folger Institute at the Folger Shakespeare Library, and the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. With special thanks to the Center for Cultural Analysis and the Department of English at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, the Department of English and the Department of History at Rutgers University, Newark, and the Department of World Languages and Cultures at Rutgers University, Camden. I'm Patricia Akini. I'm a member of the Race Before Race Executive Board, Associate Professor of English, and Chancellor Scholar in Residence at the P3 Collaboratory at Rutgers University, Newark. I'm also a member of the Organizing Committee for Race Before Race, Region and Enmity here at Rutgers University. Our conversation today will be led by Professor Kishwar Rizvi and will focus on the work and insights of visual artist Shazia Sikander. Kishwar Rizvi is Professor of Islamic Art and Architecture at Yale University. She is the author of Transnational Mosque, Architecture and Historical Memory in the Contemporary Middle East, for which she was selected as a Carnegie Foundation Scholar. The Safavid Dynastic Shrine, History, Religion and Architecture in Early Modern Iran. The Addition, Affect, Emotion and Subjectivity in Early Modern Muslim Empires, New Studies in Ottoman, Safavid and Mughal Art and Culture, and the Anthology, Modernism and the Middle East, Architecture and Politics in the 20th Century, which was awarded a Graham Foundation publication grant. She is president of the Historians of Islamic Art Association, past chair of the Council for Middle East Studies at Yale University, and principal investigator for the US Department of Education's Title VI National Resource Center grant for the Council on Middle East Studies at Yale University. Her next book, Imagining a World, Artistic and Cultural Encounters in Early Modern Iran is in progress and will be forthcoming from Yale University Press. Shazia Sikander is internationally renowned for her artistic work, which explores gender, sexuality, race, and cultural identity, often through the reinterpretation of pre-modern forms. Her training in classical Indo-Persian miniature painting at the National College of Arts in Lahore, Pakistan, eventually led to the revitalization of that form, inspiring a new generation of practitioners. Her work has since evolved to include not only large scale drawings and installations, but also multimedia work, including video and animation. As a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship and the National Medal of Arts, among many, many other accolades, to say that her work is award-winning would be an enormous understatement. Instead, I'll simply note that her work now appears in the permanent collections of prestigious institutions worldwide, including the Hirshhorn Museum, the Maxi, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles and Tokyo, the MoMA, the Guggenheim, the Whitney Museum of Art, and many more. She is the first Pakistani American to be inducted into the National Portrait Gallery at the Smithsonian. And if you're lucky, perhaps you had a chance to catch this summer's recent retrospective solo exhibition, Extraordinary Realities at the Morgan Library and Museum. You will be delighted to know that the companion volume by the same name with a catalog and collection of essays, including one by Professor Rizvi, is available in our book display. Extraordinary Realities is also traveling to RISD and MFA Houston next year in the spring, and a solo show will open at the Jesus College at Cambridge University this fall. Speaking both as a member of the Race Before Race Executive Board and of the Organizing Committee, many of whom are here with us in the audience, I'd like to say what a great pleasure it is to welcome you both today to offer this keynote conversation for Race Before Race which is a fast growing community of scholars from many disciplines thinking about race in the pre-modern world and in the present. As many members of this community will no doubt attest, we find deep connection with the work of Shanzia Sikander, which actively engages with care and intention the materials, images, and artistic traditions of the pre-modern world 
as well as with the political, religious, and cultural tensions that connect that world to our own. In a moment, we'll begin with questions from Professor Rizvi for Shazia Sakana. But our executive board and organizing committee are welcome to send questions to me um, in the chat or let me know in the chat if you have a question at any point. And towards the end of the conversation, I will call on you to unmute yourself and ask your question directly. Professor Rizvi, I'll hand things over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Professor Himi. I really appreciate being here. And it's, as always, um, a pleasure to be amongst um, colleagues uh, thinking about such complex issues uh, such as race um, in the early modern period. Um, and it's always, of course, a pleasure to talk with and engage with Shazia and her work, which I've followed for a very, very long time. So again, Shazia, you and I could talk for a long time, but we'll try and be precise. Um, one of the things that I wanted to get us started with um, as a prelude, perhaps, and is the issue of enmity, enmity um, that was used as a provocation by our colleagues for this conference, um, thinking about difference and what that means. In many ways, our homeland, our older homeland, Pakistan, um, something that you and I both share, I think we sort of grew up there at almost the same time, um, was predicated on a construct of difference. Um, the Indian subcontinent was sliced um, with the fabrication of uh, a difference that was based on religious identity of Islam um, and everything and Hinduism and what have you. And in that, in many ways, that for an early modernist like myself too, is where many of those sort of, you know questions of uh, of different start. Um, and unfortunately, here we are in the twenty first century; they remain. Um, and that construct of difference um, is one clearly that it was a construct, uh, you know, perhaps in a, a result, not perhaps, but definitely a result of a colonial world order um, that made tensions, which drew lines across uh, communities, whether they were religious communities, ethnic communities, what have you, um, whether it is the so-called Middle East, whether it's the Indian subcontinent and so on, um, the results of which we continue to see. Now, you in your work have talked a lot about um, your formative years uh, as a student back in Lahore at NCA and so on. And in the 1980s, um, again, a period that we both are familiar with, Pakistan was caught between regional and transnational actors, um, the post the Iranian revolution, the Soviet occupation in Afghanistan, um, perhaps those are the most relevant to think about in much of your work. But in many ways, um, that is the time also of Zia al uh, when the Islamic Republic really takes off. And what does that mean um, in the context of, uh, of homeland is uh, that at least in my, my city where I grew up, Karachi, the last remaining synagogue was burnt. Um, uh, the last families of Jews, for example, left, as did many other ethnic and religious minorities from that very vibrant city. Um, and this is where, in many ways, 40 years after the construction of Pakistan in 1947, 40 years later, the violence of nationalism with all its ideas of purity um, really come into play, uh, both as a political identity for this almost new nation, this Islamic Republic, and so on. So what does it mean? Um, this idea of difference is something that you talk about a lot in your work. Um, and I thought maybe we can just start with that. And especially in the subcontinent, a place that was and continues to be multi-ethnic, polyglot, um, polyreligious, and this amazing avatar of yours, and we could start with her, which references Kali, which references so many of those um, suppressed identities, those identities that have been removed from the national language, I find incredibly 
compelling. So perhaps you can start us with this one. And I have questions as we go along. Whenever you pause, I'll throw in a question. But thank you, Shazia, for your incredible work. And um, I hope this introduction gets you started as well. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Keshwarth, um, for framing um, such compelling you know, um, subjects that, that we are constantly engaged with, we even 40 years later, or you even from, you know, reflecting on, on, on the 80s and the time that you had, you were spending in, in Karachi and I was in Lahore and how, you know, how our paths have parallels and yet they went in very different directions. And at the same time, in this current moment um, in the world, when, you know, uh, what's unfolding in Afghanistan, and um, where it's all, all also it's the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So it just seems that um, I feel like I, I, I have, have this deja vu, like the work that I was making in the late 90s and almost um, some other works that I have in this PowerPoint also, which were done maybe a, a year or two before 9-11 and a few soon after. And they still have that same sort of, they have a lot of resonance right now in this moment. Like in this particular work, uh, what I wanna point out too is that the image on the right is a, a, a sort of a, it's a remnant from a large mosaic, a large mural that I was making. I was commissioned in 2001 before 9-11 by this law firm Scadden Arps. And this image, was fine till 9-11 happens. And then I was asked to censor it. And I was asked that, I was told that the, they're having a lot of problems with my, uh, with my being, having this commission or being part of this uh, project with other artists as well. And, um, and so, you know, so, so there, there's one example of how um, in that kind of moment, you know, this idea of like, the, not just the censorship, but how the work is being seen differently. Yeah. And, uh, and what is also being misunderstood is, uh, is this sort of image which deals with the syncretic history of the yeah. South Asian, as well as with the diaspora, as well as this idea of the self sort of empowered feminine uh, form, which is a, uh, which, which I was resisting the very paternalistic notion of the female, Muslim female, which is basically also uh, um, uh, happening in terms of like the, the savior of, uh, you know, the, the yeah. America's proxy wars being fought in the, in, in one, in, in one of uh, situation of like how Muslim women need need to be saved, and so so here one is sort of resisting that very um, problematic um, and deeply entrenched uh, space of the female, and uh, and at the same time you're uh, you're also re in that time and space encountering censorship. So um, so 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 yeah. So like. Uh, this work is uh, you. You wrote about it in the essay too, in 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 the book that yeah. Sadia about But it starts from it's. It was an image I created, which I called "slight and pleasing dislocation," and I was I was wondering whether you know I would be part. I would be considered as part of the South Asian diaspora. Because I, it had only been like a year or two of being in the U.S., and I felt like I, I, I wasn't being offered that space yet. <laughs> and also, it was such a monolithic category. So I was like, "There's so many differences within the diasporic community." So, so, so in terms of the difference, I started to engage with difference through the lens of intimacy. And, yeah. and, and, you know, and the, again, I think we've had these conversations like, what does it mean um, when you're in Pakistan and you cannot get visa for India? Like I've recently, the three or four times that I've applied over the last three, four years, 
every time it's been denied. And, uh, and yet you often speak on behalf of the subcontinent <laughs> and you yeah. speak on behalf of some of the visual traditions and you never have access to actually see them in person. So what type, what intimacy are we talking about? Who gets to represent what? And the truncated nature of so much of the visual material, you know, that because of its colonial legacy, it, res yeah. it resides in, 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 in institutional storages in the West. So all of these things were percolating and I, and, and I was thinking, you know, what type of Im an image should I craft, which carries this uh, complexity, but also uh, plays with um, uh, uh, it, it, it kind of the beheadedness of the female, you know, is not just about, uh, it's about erasure, but it's also like how to encompass the broader feminine um, agency and not just yeah. be about me at, or performing my identity. Because I was not interested in, in performing just my identity, but more digging in terms of uh, the broader representation of a feminine space and yeah. uh, and that's where you don't see the face or you don't see the head and then you also don't see the feet because it's self-rooted but it's having trouble rooting itself right but it's self-rooted so it can carry its roots where wherever it heads so it's buoyant it's a float it's not yeah. it's not burdened or whatever burden it carries it, it's able to carry it so yeah. it's very different from like this focus on the immigrant that, you know, where, where are you exiled or now you have to make a new home. So why can't you have multiple homes? So, so there's a lot, there, there, there was a, there are all these sort of layers in this, in this particular. Yeah. Area. I mean, it's interesting to me because, um, you know, for one thing in this, there is this, there, there in this discourse of, of the feminine, um, especially as you said, it becomes you know this construct, and you know the women's bodies have been so deeply embedded in nationalist tropes. You know whether it's education, whether it's uh, suffrage, if what what have you, and now it's become you know the veil or what you know um, they become um, proxies, as you said, also for different types of wars um, that are based on them. And I thought maybe if we could talk about one of your um, images about intimacy, um, because I think in many ways you subvert that, you know, um, and this was, again, I, I just love this series of sketches that you had here um, that really also sort of make us rethink um, what what is at stake here, right? What is it? Is it the female's body, um, female body, or what have you? And who are those enemies uh, in men, right? So, who are these enemies that one is for fighting against? Is it one, you know, when are you allowed to have your own inner self and your own inner demons as an individual? When are you allowed to not represent, or as you said, perform? being a Pakistani, being a Muslim, being a woman, or being a woman of color, it, when are you allowed to have that inner self in its own complexity and authenticity? And I find this avatar of yours really starts to do that in its own sort of formal way, in her levitation, in her you know gestures. Yeah, here also it's only... Um being projected right into yeah. space so it doesn't have a like it has a form but it's also about light so this is this is a sort of a departure for me when I was doing a residency at the Doris Duke Foundation of Islamic Art in Honolulu and I was struggling with the beauty the physical beauty the incredible um uh store uh, information material that she had in her storage and her home and and also the type of patronage you know of that era in the 1930s and the, that type of wealth and this obsession with the east so so I was like struggling with all of that and I couldn't focus on creating an object <laughs> so then I was like oh my god I have to play with something which is impossible to contain and 
and also I think my interest in light is as uh, is, is is a similar sort of interest as in the subject matter of time. So mm-hmm. I so then with those ingredients, I started to play with projection. So this image is just being projected on the trees. And there, and and of course, it's it's about erasure, it's about invisibility, it's also about a shadow, it's also about uh, 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 something which is fluttering in space, so almost like a ghost-like, or it could be the chalava that I have talked about earlier in my work, also something which is so fast and uncapturable, and yet has a very vi- vibrant but specific form. So here I was also thinking on the hyphenated identities. That's why now you see that the arms have become sort of the trope of red, white, blue, but they are also disconnected. And then at the same time, it's almost as if she's trying really hard to fly. So it's kind of like a fluttering motion. So, so you know, so again, from, from it gets conceived literally as a very immediate sketch from, from your thinking process to your hand gesture and it yeah. has so much of uh, possibilities and 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 for me that's how I um encounter or take um inspiration from the pre-modern it's not like I'm um I, I, I take I take it with a lot of affection but a lot of freedom also I don't feel like I have to take a stance of enmity towards pre-modern or that I have to guard it to such a degree that I have to claim it as something that is culturally mine, right? So I find uh, with, with that mentality, I find like I, I don't need to uh, sell my work through identity or through the nation. And, yeah. and yet, you know, I, I am who I am and I am multiple um um, a, a multivalence that exists in all of us. And, and that is the spirit that I wanted to understand for myself growing up in Pakistan that, you know, one was denied the freedom to just drive into India or get a visa or travel. And so for so long, you wanted and hoped that you would be able to do research there. And then eventually you had to you had to deal with the disillusionment that that's not going to happen. So yeah. it wasn't like, oh, I have to rush off to the West. I tried very hard to first engage with what, what was around me, but then I couldn't find any access. So eventually, you know, one figured out that there's a lot of stuff and material in the storages of the Western institution. And I and thus, you know, that became sort of a detective like pursuit. But yeah which then was being constructed very unfairly, especially after post 9-11 that, you know, you're performing your identity in the West or that you're exotic to the West. What, what is not exotic to the West? <laughs> you know, everything made in China is exotic to the West, like consumerism is exotic to the West. So this, I, these very problematic dichotomies and binaries of oppression and freedom and Asian and whiteness or, you know, Islam and the rest or West and Islam, like these, these are, uh, are not just current situations. No, exactly. Deep, deep, deep. I mean, so, that's, a, that's the, that's in many ways the irony of it, right? Because in, in some of the, this language that we see deployed again and again is, is, um, you know, you just thinking about the concept of race itself, you know, it, is a historically embedded idea. Um, but before I go further, I mean, one of the things that I just absolutely love with the fact that you are sort of, in some sense, desecrating, but also giving life to these older images. I mean, this is from the Pachanama, the Pachanama, you know, this sort of incredibly ceremonial, massive folio that is painted painstakingly. Um, But in its formality, uh, a book such as this has also suppressed, has it had had its own suppressions, um, whether they are of, you know, the multiple hands, as we know, and again, you know, in painters in Lahore could have been Hindu, they could have been Jain, they could have been Muslim, what have you. Um, But also one of the stories that's written out of the history of this medium is that young women 
princesses for the most part were also taught to paint. Um, and not only were they patrons. So, you know, if we're moving away from the idea of, okay, great women were patrons of the arts, but women were also being taught to paint. So their hands have also washed against these gestures, against this object, perhaps not this one in particular, but they would have been trained not only to see, but also to make. Um, and I think your reclaiming of this medium of, of the manuscript, the painting, and what have you is also very much a sort of reinstituting of um, what, like you and I know, we didn't have access to. You know, exactly like you, you know, I, for myself, I wanted to work on Pakistan and on Sindh and what have you, but you couldn't, because you couldn't go to India, you couldn't tell the full story of what was in Pakistan, right? Because in some sense, the nation has been bifurcated, that region has been bifurcated, um, such that all our stories, whether we're writing them from India or we're writing them from Pakistan, are always incomplete. Within them is a certain loss because we can't cross an artificial border. Um, but, but my excitement with this work, of course, is also, you know, the freedom that you have to desecrate it, to enliven it. And all of those words, I see them as complete positives, by the way. Um, I think that's really, really good. But as you said, intimacy of, of your own hand, of your gesture um, against this seemingly, you know, pure form of art, I think is important to keep in mind because purity perhaps never existed, right? When we, especially when we talk about the, the early modern or now, um, it's a complete fiction. So, you know, what, what one got introduced from was a scholarship by mostly Western scholars, mostly male and white. And uh, <laughs> so, so, I, so that too is like, how do you diversify in terms of how do you read some of this material? It, if it, if it was much later that I realized that many times, you know, some of the unknown artists were made up names too. So how things were often ascribed, like there hardly ever I encountered any women names. So it, it always was very mysterious that there must have been, you know, a kind of of some women that may have either painted or been involved in the patronage, et cetera, they were writing poetry. So it's like, how, why, why is such an absence of the female? And, um, and the more I dug there, of course, it, it uh, you know, that becomes a sort of a very um, loving and complex thread in my work is understanding how do you engage with with like a feminist trope within this space, but not, but not, and also like what, what is, what is that kind of a space of a very large, broad, uh, in, you know, uh, idea of the of the feminine, not just the Western space of, of feminism, but broadly, of, you know, how do you uh, counter a very opaque term of third world feminism and that's that's that that was that was being offered in the 90s was just third world feminism and then <laughs> it, it, it was like the always the burden was on on me or the burden yeah. was on, the, on us to tell our story again and again and again and it continues and um and and yet you know that 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 no, so what I started to do here was like I started to bring in um, poets like young artists at that time, like Praveen Shakir or Famida Riaz or even Isma Chakai and open up their um, rereading of their texts in conversation with things that I was getting introduced to like Bell Hooks or Michelle Wallace. Yeah you know um even uh, helen susu so it, so that <laughs> this course starts to um open up very um experimental and you know kind of almost uh, fun ways of understanding the possibilities and of and this this may this work can also be seen through that 
um, lens yeah. where all these women are accumulating in a space where they wouldn't necessarily exist. And then in, in their accumulation, they leave a trace behind. So they leave their bodies, but the hair is left. And I demystify that. So in the way through animation, I show how the bodies accumulate. Then I show how the bodies disappear. So I'm not trying to create, I'm, the mystery is there, but it's also a very non-nostalgic way. It's not about glorifying the past. And, and yet I show that there are so many possibilities with trenchant forms in terms of giving them new meanings. And then, of course, this idea of the gopi is uh, connected to the notion of how do you represent Radha? Is she just, you know, a gopi, one of the preferred gopis? So here, I it's also the collective feminine space, taking, taking more, more autonomy, taking more ownership. And, um, and then, you know, moving forward, the works that were, all of these works were made in the US, but here, uh, I think when I moved uh, to Houston and then have uh, uh, got interested in the dynamics of North and the South and American um, civil rights histories and movements, but I, I had also, as a, as a young kid, had lived in Somalia. So my interest, you know, of course, uh, of understanding the African American uh, history was uh, uh, had a, a different degree of intimacy and a familiarity, or a lack of it, or a familiarity in the sense that growing up in Pakistan, my grandfather always talked about Malcolm X, or we yeah. knew we we had an affection for uh, Muhammad Ali, right? Or we we knew. Uh, about, I knew about Nation of Islam. So, but I was also curious about understanding what these dynamics were within the rootedness of an American experience. What yeah. was the idea of the, uh, of, of the international black power and space, right? Yeah. And, and so, so that gravity, that's one element that leads me into the space of race, but from a very different perspective. It's a very black and white country. And, and so then I as the more I started to dig, the more I realized that within these revered traditions of medieval Western art or Western art history, there is so much anti-blackness. And the more I, I was like, oh, right there are parallels with the politicization of the, of the veil. Oh, and, and, and in this particular painting, that's what I'm, I'm drawing links with is that both, one is this history of Orientalism. And then there is this other issue around the uh, derogatory representation of Black. So both were happening you know, in traditions that already have been interfacing each other for a long time in terms of the medieval manuscripts. So it, it just, every time I, I looked into the pre-modern forms, there were it for me. It just echoes, um, you know, what continues to happen in our culture. So, well, I think what's really, yeah. I mean, I think that I I really wanted you to talk about this painting. Um, oh, don't go away, the one on the left, because <laughs> I I find it incredibly intriguing. You know, I mean, with the Gopi one, I mean, of course, you know, the whole issue of women's hair and hygiene and that obsession with again you know of 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 of, of the well enlightenment really is when we start seeing this in Europe, you know, this the women's excretions, you know, whether it's their hair or their bodily fluids and what have you, this sort of obsession of controlling that. And with your, your gopis, they go wild and crazy and they're all over the place. But even in this painting, you know, and I, I it, there's something going on with certain types of symbols, right? Um, the dreadlock, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, Kali's, um, sword there are certain symbols that you bring in which I think are so fascinating but you know also I totally agree with you I think people don't realize the kind of global impact of figures like Muhammad Ali like you know I remember watching you know George Foreman and the rumble in the jungle and you know all of those things because we all associated and we all linked 
with these figures, um, because we had shared an experience, um, at, you know, in the subcontinent of 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 colonialism, of of being, you know, wrenched out of our own histories, um, and to see someone like Muhammad Ali winning, we all won. You know, it was a global uh, moment. It, uh, or you know, I the, so that there there those stories also need to be heard in exactly in the sort of nuance that you bring in this work and it's yours it's your story right yeah. um as oh. much as it is an american story yeah and and and, and you know again the irony of of um uh, at least in my experience of the education that i received in pakistan in the 80s the sort of still a residual of the colonial schooling or whatever, you know, the Catholic school that I went to. It, I I didn't, I don't think I ever heard of Ibn al Arabi. <laughs> you know, so here, that's a much more unfamiliar, exotic <laughs> oh, uh, 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 idea. And that's who that learned man is in the in this particular painting. So, you know, and, and it made, it could actually be from a painting which may just be described as the learned man. But I'm taking the liberty to, to then say, I'm gonna define that learned man as Ibn al -Arabi. Yeah. Because it, who, who, who claimed that that's a learned man? It's, it's gonna be one of the white male historian that wrote that book whenever in the 70s or 80s. So I, so when somebody asked me, oh, who is that? I'm like, that is Ibn al Arabi. <laughs> so, you know, so that level of freedom that I think as a visual artist you take, but you're often denied because you're not technically the art historian. So, you know, then you're often told, just keep performing within your lane. We don't need yeah hear your politics, just be, just make your work. Or somebody else comes along and tends to always talk about your work with their agenda. And it's yeah. not that it, only, that it only happens in the West. In my experience, it happens equally and oftentimes in much more violent ways in Pakistan about my work. And, yeah. you, know, and you, know, you can never talk about those things because Oh no, then you're going to be called anti-Pakistan. I was like, there's nothing anti-Pakistan about my work. But see how the slippage tends to happen in terms yeah. of, of, of this idea of the authentic. And, and that unfortunately is, is, is a deeply deep-rooted issue with the thing called colonial histories and legacies that we have to entangle ourselves from. Well, it's colonial, and you know, and at the same time, it's it is this this world order where we are told that you know we have mobility, that we have choice, that we can move from one place to the other because you know, it, it's it's a it's um whether it's technology that allows us to do that or what have you, um. But as we all are experiencing, you know, borders are harder than ever. National identities are even more um, fixed, whether we like it or not, because of mi migration issues or what have you. Um, and the, the the threat, in some sense, of your work is is because it slips across borders. It slips, slips across historical borders um, as well as regional ones, uh, religious borders, and that's I think part of it is that that ambivalence, I suppose, um, is your power, right? It, it allows you to take what you will. Um, and not necessarily, as you mentioned, to keep explaining who you are, right? I mean, I think that burden is a very deep one. I wanted to ask you, um, I know we, we sort of have time issues, but you, when you and I were talking about, you know, this painting, um, these paintings were done pre 9-11, in a sense, um, that, that these paintings allowed you had a certain freedom that post 9-11, you couldn't. Like in some ways, um, most people, if you were identified with being Muslim or from Pakistan or, you know, from now, this, again, Pakistan is suddenly part of the Middle East, according to the United States government, um, is that 
you are jettisoned out of a possibility of being an ally, right? Um, of having, being able to have a conversation. We, you know, are sort of forced to explain other stories that might not, again, have been our stories to tell. But could you maybe speak, and I think we should start opening it up to our colleagues as well, um, but could you speak about your experience? Oh, I love this one. Um, <laughs> in the sort of, you know, other types of, you know, performances that your work is being forced into before and then after 9-11, or even as I resist and I think this painting so beautifully makes clear 9-11 is not where the world changed. The world 9-11 is because of a world happening, moving in a certain direction. And this painting really, I think, does that in such a beautiful way. Yeah, I think here also this painting is, um, you know, was two years before 9-11. So, and again, yeah. it was proposing that the next millennium would probably we would be occupied with America's uh, interface with Muslim countries or American pol foreign policy in Muslim countries. Because already, if you looked backward for you know the last fifty years or so, you would you would see that that's exactly what what was happening. And there are so many shape shifters in this uh, in this particular work. So who was a friend becomes a foe. You know. Uh, there's American um, militarism. It's also America flexing its um, military muscle everywhere. So it's it's uh, it, it, it. I I try to sort of take the idea of the manuscript and and then play with that form with a little bit more interest in pop culture, in media, in current politics, and in portraiture and use it as that sort of a springboard and an armature that I thought, you know, it could easily sort of um, move in that direction much more, much more readily. But again, the resistance here is that it's uh, these paintings that I was making were not about my, were not autobiographical. And I was given a space that, you know, you in the art world, especially, you 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 are often just about it's all about performing your identity or it tends to be such or even if it isn't the curatorial um platforms are focused heavily on identity yeah. so no matter no matter what depth and complexity my work contained it would nobody would talk about the work they would talk about my biography and, and that continues to happen for, I'm not exaggerating, 15, 20 years. Yeah. And, and, it, and, I, and then I just sort of naturally move away from the art world, keep making my work, but I don't venture into a very commercial career. And I gravitate towards a, towards a lot of authors or academics or scholars. And those are places where, you know, conversations keep sort of happening and, and, uh, and now, literally at this time in, in the show that's up at the Morgan Library, the wall labels, um, I, I, I fought for them. I worked with curators that wanted, that, that, that took the care and attention to share and it share, yeah. share what the works are referring to or the historical things that they are citing, but also, so it's, reflective it's not telling you how to read the work but it's for the first time uh, some american institution is uh, is showing care to ex uh, engage with the work which is american which was made yeah. in the country but for me it has taken 25 plus years to be given that platform and that's the that's the bizarreness of being you know visible and invisible and yeah. uh, and and of course you know these are works which were done that long time ago and they're resonating a lot with uh, currently with a lot of people the show is very well visited it's gotten good sort of reviews but it's also i've seen a huge amount of young south asians are coming to see the show yeah so 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 yeah so so it's it's just that <laughs> You know, oh, there's a lot. It's very traumatic, yeah. also, to uh, to to function in America, 
where you know some of this was this baggage was there in the 90s and this baggage is still here <laughs> well i mean i think my last point will be um you know uh when the when the rewriting of the story of american art is done um that you're not at the corner you're at the center because what you're doing is expanding you're expanding our definition of what american art in the 21st century in the late 20th century is right i mean i think that's where most of us have to start recentering rethinking where that idea of difference might do and especially within the case such as of artists such as your yourself um so thank you i'm I, again you and i are going to talk forever uh but i think our colleagues have I'm sure many, many interesting questions here. So Patricia, I'm going to now hand this over to you to moderate. I definitely, I have questions myself, but I first, I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed. I could go on listening to the two of you in conversation. I was particularly enjoyed. Um, Shazia, you're just talking a lot about the avatar image, about the gopis and their disembodied hair, because these are images that I have contemplated, you know, for a long time. So to hear you talk about those was really wonderful. But also, um, I think I identified so closely, and I'm sure many of us do, with the experience that you describe of a tension between your identity as perceived by others and its relationship to the work that you do now and have done in the past, and that that is not always a pleasant experience, depending on who's doing the who's doing the using and for what purposes. So I thank you for sharing that as well. I know we have several questions already in the chat, and I want to start by asking Professor Hall to unmute. Um, Professor Hall had a couple of questions in the chat that um, I think either or both of them would be a great place to start. Um, so Professor Hall, will you unmute and lay it on us? Okay, um, I'm a little surprised, sorry. Thank you so much that I also could listen like all day and all night to this. So I guess I'll ask, start with my specific question about the, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Eileen, those memorial bearings and what you were doing what the what you were doing with the uh, coats of arms in there, which to me spoke to questions of lineage. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and whether that might also be related to what you're doing with the borders in that piece, um, the kind of cutting through borders that seems a little different from some of the other pieces. So sorry, that was rambling, but I just love it. Of course, so, you know, so, um... Thank you for that question, but um, the so I here in this slide, I just kind of wanted to show where uh, the armorial bearings are coming from. So it's a book about the representation of Black in medieval West. So when I was kind of reading and learning about it, I uh, it, I I was aware that you know these were problematic images. So in my painting, I. I am questioning how to counter. So the armorial bearing that I create is on the left and it's of the project row houses in yes. Houston. And of course, um, you know, I encounter the row houses and the third ward when I moved to Houston, which is towards the end of 95, I think in 96, I, I, I'm doing a residency there. I'm very involved with the community and uh, so, so it's not something that is being made in abstraction. It is, uh, it is me almost recording my lived experience. Mm. So, so, th so that's that's one thing. But then I'm also um, threading in or incorporating this sort of the, the avatar or the very com complex uh, image of uh, the persistence of this image in in westerns. Western imagination of the female Muslim woman. Mm -hmm. And you see her often, you know, it, it's like, uh, it's the veil, if, whether, it, where, do you see if that's a veil? It's, a, yes. it, for me, the tendrils. They could be, now that I'm looking at it, it, it could be dreadlocks, right? But they are tendrils or it's almost like a shredded space. It could also be, 
wings. It can also be, it's almost like a doodle like. So it's like a little kind of with a, wit, with a little more wit. It's, uh, it, she's, she's standing on and confronting Ibn al Arabi. Is she, is she on a, is she standing on a book? I don't know. Some people have asked me, is, she, is, is that the female representation in the Quran? Like, of course, as a visual artist, there's going to be a lot of um, openness and how, how a viewer reads the work is going to depend also on, on the things that they're going to focus on. But I'm already engaging with a medium which is so illustrative and very precise. So for me to create tension, I, I, I wanted to keep the narrative a little open-ended, but yet be ambitious, you know, in imagining and capturing um, the interface I'm having with, with the overlapping diasporas and communities. So thank you for that. I, uh, thank you for clarifying what's going on with the, the armor on the left, because it makes you re think about how these Black figures are kind of drawn into kind of white conceptions of property at inheritance and so that you kind of like that that kind of explodes all that and I love that you remind us of the wit of your work so appreciate all of that thank you thank you I I'm going to turn to a, I think a related question because um Shanti, that your answer which talks about um ambition which is a great word in approaching these texts that are might otherwise be considered texts and materials from the modern world that might otherwise be considered pure or sacred um, and approaching them with ambition and intention and there's a question from um professor Shagandi about solidarity in the chat that i think goes directly to this um, so can i ask professor professor Chagandi, could you uh, unmute yourself and ask that question Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, and I think you're totally right. This is in a lot of ways like a good um, follow up to Kim's question about the painting as well. Um, and thank you so much um, for this panel and for the beautiful work. Um, yeah, I actually, so I've been trying to think about, you know, um, the theme of enmity and its relationship to political solidarity. You know, I feel like that's kind of like, to me, that seems like an important, you know, sort of, um, undercurrent, you know, of, of thinking about, you know, enmity as a theme. Um, and I noticed that, you know, um, the question of representations of Blackness and also of anti-Blackness kind of seemed to be a theme that was sort of running through a lot of what you both had to say. Um, and so I just, I wanted to ask about like really specifically the sort of history and politics of Black Asian and Afro-Asian solidarity, you know, um, and what, um, what you think that your work is saying about that really complicated question, you know, beyond sort of just expressing affinity of some kind, because I think it is, you know, it's a, uh, um, it's it's a really complicated arena, but you know, but a really important one, I think, you know, in um, in political action moving forward in the United States and worldwide. So I just wondered about, you know, your thoughts about Black Asian solidarity in particular and how you think your work expresses those. Thank you. Well, um, some of these paintings, like this one, actually is me uh, in, in the same in the same art. It's another artist. So the trickster image is coming from the painter David McGee's work. So, so it's not like just me making the work. It's like I am the work is being made by the autonomy of the artist is in the work. So it's a collaborative piece, and. Um, and, and I just wanted to point that out because of course my language is, um, is uh, visual and it's painting, but I'm letting the, uh, but, I'm, but this painting is being born from uh, a, a, another artist's image that they painted in it. And then the involvement of the work is where, where two people are placing their marks, their ideas and building the layers together, which is a very different um, understanding of the construction of the work versus me um, creating the painting and then its theme being about solidarity. So, so just kind of wanted to point that out also because in the show at the Morgan, there are several such 
events that happen in my practice. In the early 90s, I gravitated to another um, visual artist uh, who was African-American. She, she passed away, Donna Maria Bruton. She was hired by RISD, I think one of the first women of color at that time, just a few years older. And we become good friends and it's through that engagement with, with uh, Donna and uh, her introduction, she, her, she introducing me to you know some scholars and writers and us uh, engaging with um, issues around patriarchy or a very white male art world and what it meant for our work, what our work was um, continuing to do. So a lot of the forms that evolved, I think in my work, uh, were really based on these conversations with her. So th this is of that time, uh, the slight and pleasing dislocation and some of these monstrous forms that kind of emerge that have like a little bit of a play with the feminine body. They are, they really came about in with conversations with, with Donna. So, um, and so, 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 it's, so it's very organic. And it's also, you know, I, uh, it's something that I'm autom I'm naturally gravitating to a certain uh, a certain person, an artist, and of course uh, there's a there's a level of affinity there that will that comes forth as we get to know each other. And uh, this is a time when you know art history books did not have like an elaborate representation on on South Asian feminist. Um, scholarship or 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 anything or knowledge of of uh, of not just like um uh, the literary uh, tr writers but also visual artists were not necessarily understood or talked about so it was always uh i had to bring names into the conversations and i had to let people know or i had to find you know books or xeroxes and and share information about others so it was a very at that time of a far more sort of the Asian space was pretty invisible in 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 graduate school at that time, and uh, some of this work is literally from that from from that particular period, and um, and in terms of you know um, how in currently I feel like uh, if I, even if I say may, I made a painting a couple of years ago, I was talking to Kishwar earlier, and I, I think it's about it's on the pro it's drawing links with Nasser Jones, the rap artist, and uh, Langston Hughes. But I always wonder if that work would ever be shown in a show that might encompass that the theme with. Uh, with a uh, you know a theme where I'm not the African American artist, so would my work ever be part of something like that? Probably not. So you know, but like in the or in the like in that time in the mid '90s, I remember when at the row houses there were big projects happening where I was in in a show with Whitfield Lavelle, Fred Wilson, Carrie Mae Weems is there. So there, so so I wonder. I was proposing like you know ha, ha, have ha, has this idea of who got gets to be part of what is is it very fluid or porous or is it changing constantly a, um around the dynamics of um or not just race and representation but also in terms of um uh, in terms of scholarship in terms of um you know like i what is often what is expected from me, even though people may know that I'm I, I'm creating the work here, or they may may know of my work. It's uh, always uh, tell us more about the other you as the other. It's never okay. Let me understand how you know your influences with all these other artists were helping shape an American vernacular too, and. And so that that sort of um, that that's what I think often um, I, I wonder is that um, my work was also influencing other artists and many artists that are very well known American artists, but oftentimes my work is not 
seen or placed in shows or collections in proximity to those conversations. They, my work is often then is like in a, in a place where either they, it has to be in a group show of Pakistani artists or a group show of South Asian artists. But over there, the South, the Pakistani group show doesn't want to put my work in it because there's, they want to sell the image of the authentic Pakistani artists that are making the work from within Pakistan. So, you know, so like when, so, so these are, these are very, these are things that I don't have answers for, but they of course um, are, are very significant things that I think about because my work is always trying to, um, you know, um, kind of step outside of the binaries or how I can create multiple points of entry. So it's always about uncertainty and a multivalence. And for that, it can go right from sexuality to race and back into colonial representations and right into um, um, nation tensions. So, so I take a lot of liberty. Sita, can I, I just uh, maybe 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 Kishore can yeah. <laughs> I know I just want to I just want to jump in because I think that was I know Patricia and we have friends we'll go five minutes over or something but uh, um, but I was really intrigued by your question um, Sita because I think it really is important um, you, you know one of the things that you are, are very aware of is you know in the subcontinent you know the language of divide and conquer right, I think is one that is so deeply embedded in many of our experiences. Um, and in terms of, you know, thinking about a South Asian um, Black identity or conversations is so important because it's, we've been taught to see ourselves as different and our experiences are, of course, very different, but there are so many similarities and we couldn't choose which one we want to look at. Now, of course, within the subcontinent, you have an array, right? I mean, so you also have, again, you know, slavery and you have migrations that are passing through the subcontinent. The whole India um, and East Africa, Indian Ocean trade, one of the biggest trade networks of slavery was passing right through. Um, and we have large communities of, of um, you know, that were, that are now mixed and not mixed and what have you. So that's, again, another story that we forget that even within South Asia, race is a very important and complex and very much unresolved issue, um, you know, that, again, we, we, we create separations as though that's the way we need to think. But historically, um, and even today, uh, these, these realities are ones that we are not really contending with in a very productive way. And I, I'm, I'm just curious to know, um, perhaps in this conversation, others, what your, where that question was coming from within your own work as well. Sorry, were you asking me or do you want to have others comment? On well, I, yeah, I think what well, I was asking you, but maybe uh, in the, uh, if you have a quick answer, then otherwise Patricia will get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, I think for, well, I mean, I think it, it's a, it's, it's kind of a combination of work and, of, of like scholarly work and organizing work in a sense, you know, where I'm, I'm in a lot of, um, you know, I'm in a fair number of multiracial organizing spaces where I'm thinking a lot about the racial dynamics of those spaces, you know, um, and what kinds of, um, you know, what kinds of hierarchies get implicitly created and observed in them. So that's one, you know, that's one way in which I, I find myself having to think about this a lot. Um, I recently wrote a piece about the history of cross-racial solidarity and ways that medieval studies could maybe learn from, you know, um, fields like critical ethnic studies that have actually been thinking a lot about these questions about both, you know, from the sociological end, the, you know, the kind of um, some of the really difficult dynamics of particularly Black Asian solidarity, you know, to like, a, you know, I think on the more humanist end of the spectrum, there's more of a sort of tendency to think about racialization as comparative in certain ways, you know, um, so that that's a, you know, it's a somewhat different conversation that happens about, you know, um, uh, about some of these racial categories, but I think that these are all, th you know, I, I think these are conversations that, you know, um, would, that I think pre-modern fields need to think about, not 
just to benefit themselves, but to actually think about, you know, what these kinds of solidarities can accomplish, you know, beyond um, beyond these fields, right? Whether they are humanist or artistic, you know. So I'm, I mean, so I think it's partly an issue of, you know, just um, what the relationship is between the kind of personal experience Chelsea was talking about and sort of neighborhood and community, and what, you know, um, what how those kinds of hopes, you know, whether they are um, anti-racist, abolitionist, whatever they are, you know, uh, how, how those are going to start to be made real in the world, you know, um, and, and can they be made real in the world, you know, through some of the mechanisms that we have, you know, sort of put ourselves into these sort of humanistic, you know, artistic uh, mechanisms. So sorry, that's kind of long, but that was my, that was where I was coming from. Thank you for the time. And I think that's actually a wonderful place for us to wrap up because it points us back towards the, the theme of this particular iteration of Race Before Race, where one of our questions is, to what extent does our tendency, you know, consciously or unconsciously to sort of to silo, to categorize, and to erase some of the collaborations that cross borders, both kind of um, um, both implicit and explicit. You know, how can we make those conversations more visible, those collaborations more visible, and how can we talk openly about the experience of those kinds of hierarchizations that Sita described, um, and how can we work against those? Because ultimately, those kinds of experiences and that tendency to silo or otherwise is an impediment to the larger work, which is to think um, and act in an anti-racist way and towards an anti-racist future. And that's one of our missions um, as, uh, as a community of scholars in Race Before Race. So thank you so much for sharing your, so much about your personal experiences um, in the art world, which I think are not, in, not dissimilar to what many of us experience as academics in the humanities in particular, and especially those of us who might identify um, as Black, Indigenous, or people of color working on race in pre-modern periods. But I certainly will take away um, from our conversation your description of feeling free and unencumbered in encountering works from the past, um, taking hair right off the heads of gopis and letting them fly away is the kind of spirit that I hope to bring to my work and I hope that others will take away from this conversation as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure to have you both.